there's a lot of bad information out in the world when it comes to wolves. A lot of coffee shop talk that, you know, wolves are bloodthirsty and they just kill everything. And um, I, I don't, I don't understand like these, these statements that make them out to just be horrible. Um, it's just a wolf and it's just a, a wolf pack. And for the most part, they're just doing their wolfy thing. I think in terms of the depth of knowledge that has come from her research, it's unsurpassed. In my opinion, she's the best field biologist left that goes out every day and tries to understand how wolves relate to their environment and one another. She's out there in blizzards when it's 40 below. She's out there in summertime when it's 100 degrees and hot as hell. Oh my gosh, I bet Val has logged 200,000 miles on that ranch, looking for and learning about wolves, walking and driving and riding. She's studied wolves from every possible angle. It'd be no exaggeration to say that Val Asher is for wolves in North America, what Jane Goodall was for chimps in Africa. Hey, don't film this. I got it. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Brick. Hi, big boy. Oh, look at you. Who's that? Very nice. Hello. <gasps> you should never ask who Brick and Drum is. I could sit here for hours telling you stories about Brick and Drum. All right, they are, uh, they are two bull bison that I managed to uh, raise, bottle feed and raise. Brick was, uh, Brick's mom had died, so he was an orphan calf. Two months later, Drum shows up and he was just wandering around on his own, all dehydrated, anyway. The boys grabbed him and brought him here, and I never should have done it, and I imprinted the heck out of him. The thing I like about these guys, they're similar to wolves. Like, they, they're social, and they like companionship. I'd love to take him back home and run him through the house and blow his little bison mind. The house would be wrecked, but it would be so much fun. Bye, Brick. Bye, Drummer. The Flying D uh, is a serious ranching operation. The livestock of choice is American Plains bison. Ted Turner bought the Flying D in 1989, about 114,000 acres. This had been a historic cattle ranch. It had been overgrazed. 
He brought in bison, turned them loose. Slowly over time, the herd grew in size. In fact, it grew so large that it became the largest herd in North America, even larger than the wild herd in Yellowstone a few miles down the road. You know, we first cut sign of gray wolves in 2002. I think we documented the first litter of pups in probably 2005 or 2006. So an educated guess is that the flying D wolves, which we call the bear trap pack, came from Yellowstone. By 2010, the bear trap pack was one of the largest packs in North America on the flying D, typically including 15 to 25 animals. When wolves arrived, Ted didn't panic. He just said, let's see what happens. Let's see what they do. And then one of uh, the great studies uh, in modern times began to unfold. You had Mike Phillips, who was head of the Turner Endangered Species Fund, and he brought in this dynamic young wolf biologist by the name of Val Asher. Do you know exactly where the den is, or are we going to have to scour? Uh, yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I haven't been there for a bit. It's, I mean, it's been a couple years. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I have an idea. It's been interesting because, obviously, wolves eat meat. And so here we are trying to raise bison. We're making money off of elk hunts and elk is what's for dinner. So there is some competition going on there. And the big question is, even though we would support having wolves on the ranch, there was, they were wondering how, how much do they eat? What are they eating? And so that's where I come in. And look at all these bones. Every day Val goes out and her duty is to understand, her job is to understand wolf bison elk interactions as best as she can when gray wolves showed up it was new to everyone and we knew that good reliable information would help people understand the reality of wolves on the ranch so in part her job is to share with the rest of us help the rest of us understand the nature of the flying d ranch and there you have it a wolf den All right, if I get stuck, you have to pull my legs out, okay? Okay. Oh, I don't think I'm gonna get very far. It's, it's tight. Oh, <laughs> shit. It's too narrow for me to get in there. But it goes back a long ways, like really long ways. So in the den, it's pretty much mom, you know, nursing pups and, and she's keeping that pretty clean. So, and the pups at that point, um, you know, don't even have teeth. So it isn't until that they're old enough to start getting out and exploring, they're starting to be weaned, and that's when the toys start happening. I found like mud flaps from trucks that they've brought in. I found sandals and just junk. Yeah, and then you'll see the adults like just not near the pups. They're keeping an eye on them, but they're not like hanging until somebody comes in and then plays with them. It's an extended family group, mom, dad, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and everybody contributes to raising those pups. And it's, it's cool. I mean, it's relatable, you know? It, you, I feel like I'm anthropomorphizing, but I can't think of a better, um, what would you call it, uh, way to, explain a family group of wolves. They're so much like us.
Val and her colleagues have never gone in and uh, tried to zealously control wolves. Rather, they've stepped back and watch to see what's going to happen. She doesn't force things. I think she innately understands that if you force things, uh, you're really not learning about nature. You're learning what nature does in the presence of a forcing. So she's largely learning what the landscape will tell her through patience and diligence. She's very quiet and sensitive and soft in the best of ways. And, and she's become a very important figure for Ted as he celebrates the nature of the ranch. He's a very good naturalist himself, but he benefits like all of us from her insights. Ted celebrates having wolves on the ranch. When we were figuring out like how they're gonna affect bison, I remember him saying, well, they can have some of them, but they can't have all of them. Ted's vision is to make it sustainable where you can still have all the wildlife and still be able to ranch. And with wolves, I mean, that's my job. It's the, the biggest question is, what do wolves eat? There was a time where I was picking up scat, probably for like eight years I was picking up scat. And uh, what that tells you is what they're eating. And then I'm also looking for dead. And so when I find a carcass, you know, you do a necropsy and predators have a signature to how they kill. And so my first question is, who did it? And then second, why you? You see these two bite marks, like canine teeth? And they didn't puncture. So I, uh, I'm gonna, uh, Crack the femur, look at the condition of the animal, because that's one of our last fat reserves, is the marrow in the femur. And then I'm gonna take a couple of legs, I'll boil them out, and that's just to look for uh, vulnerability. So this one's goofy. You see this hump here, this bulge? And this is what it's supposed to look like. So this is normal, and this is abnormal. It's gotta hurt, and it probably makes them limp, makes them lame, and it takes boiling all this out to be able to look for those vulnerabilities. So when I kind of compile everything, you know, at least close to 70% of confirmed wolf kills on the ranch, uh, I can find something wrong with those animals. They have taken some bison calves, a few yearlings, but elk is, elk is what's for dinner. Pretty nice, Rudy. <laughs> the gorgeous bone. It's about ready to go in the pot, too. If you have a dog, then you have an insight into wolf behavior. If you have multiple dogs, you have insight into a wolf pack. The, there's the same behaviors are going on, the same body language is going on. They're a family group. And, you know, for wolves, I mean, they're not domesticated and they have to eat. And so that part, I think, is hard for people. When wolves first showed up on the ranch, some of the folks here wondered why you would want welcome wolves. It just sounds like trouble, but it's not near as bad as what was thought. The impact of gray wolves on the Flying D bison operation is insignificant. Indeed, the impact of gray wolves on the Flying D's big game hunting operation is insignificant. We have a stunning example that coexisting with gray wolves is a relatively straightforward affair that requires only a modicum of accommodation. Now, why does that matter? 
Wolf recovery has always been hamstrung by one simple thing. Wolf recovery is hamstrung by the mythical wolf. This belief that the wolf has a supernatural ability to exercise its predatory will on a whim. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. If anything, they're just curious cowards. I've been surrounded by a bunch of wolves. Once they realized I was a person, they basically peed on themselves to get out of the, you know, get out of there. They're not as mystical as people think. I mean, I guess that's, that's where I should go with this, is that they're not that mystical. Um, you know, they're, they don't float, and they're not godly, and I don't think they're ruthless killers. It's just, it's just not another animal, you know? And, you know, I think we throw these perceptions, and some people are just like, you either really love them, or they really hate them. You know, it's, it's a very polarized, very polarized species. I like them. I'm not gonna say I really love them. I'm not gonna say I really hate them. I like them. To me, that's, they represent wildness. Okay, so, so the wolves have their puppies at a rendezvous site over this hill. And uh, we're gonna head that way, stay behind the hill kind of uh, pop up a little closer. We'll just get settled and wait and uh, hopefully get to see something and hear them. Most people have not experienced wild places. And you go out on the ranch and you have the opportunity to run into grizzly bear tracks. You have the opportunity to hear wolves howl. And every time I hear them, I just, I smile. It's an experience that is what true wild is. There is no doubt that the Flying D is a crystal clear example of the role of private land in conserving nature. It illustrates that you can do good and do good business at the same time. Ted Turner knows that wildlife conservation, if it doesn't pay for itself over time, can't last. And so what he proved with wolves is that through better, wiser management, through being conscientious and having science available, he proved that people can coexist with wolves and they better the ecosystem. They just bring magic to this ranch. It's proof that coexistence is possible.